Today is July 21st, 2020. My name is Mark Arlapage. Welcome to this very special training session, Recession Response. Video and audio is currently muted for our members here. Uh, this session is expected to run for about 50 minutes, ending around 1.50 p.m. Eastern time. The training uh, should run for about 30, 35 minutes or so. Mike's going to be talking a lot about his new book, Fix This Next. He'll talk about the book at the, at the end and how you might be able to get it. Uh, but what a lot of, about a lot of what he's going to be training is from the book. So uh, be aware of that. And, uh, and if you don't have the book, go grab it. You can see it there in the back behind Mike, Fix This Next, yellow book. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, post them. Post them in the Q&A box. And that way, when we're ready for Q&A, we can do that. Uh, I think I might be able to have people on Zoom ask their own questions. But if not, you could just post them in the Q&A, and I will ask them for you. Um, Mike Michalowicz, welcome to Entree Architect special session today. Mark, thank you for having me, and uh, I am ready to roll, brother. All right, let me just do a little intro for anybody who may not know who you are, which... <clears throat> Is unlikely, unlikely at this point. <laughs> I don't know about uh, that. We talk about you a lot at the Entree mm. Architect community, so it's unlikely that too many people don't know who you are. Mike Michalowicz, he is the author of Profit First, Clockwork, Surge, The Pumpkin Plan, and his newest release, Fix This Next. By his 35th birthday, Mike had founded and sold two companies, one to private equity and to another uh, to Fortune 500. Today, he's running his third multi-million dollar venture, Profit First Professionals. Mike is a former small business columnist for the Wall Street Journal, a former business makeover specialist at MSNBC. And over the years, Mike has traveled the globe speaking with thousands of entrepreneurs and is joining us today to share the best of what he's learned along the way. Today, Mike will be sharing his thoughts on one of the biggest challenges that we uh, are facing as small business owners, probably in, in this generation, probably the biggest uh, challenge that we've ever faced this approaching economic storm. We have this COVID virus going around yeah. and, and economy has been shut down literally for a couple of months and we're coming back right now. But the, the economy is definitely going to be affected by that. And so how do we respond to that? How do we prepare for that? So Mike Michalowicz is here to help us talk about that, sort of prepare us for that, give us a little bit of tips on how we can put together our uh, own situations as small business owners, as small firm architects. Mike Michalowicz, this Entree Architect special session is all yours, my friend. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me, Mark. And uh, hello, everyone, enjoying the balmy hot weather. Seems like it's happening everywhere except for South Africa, apparently. You're freezing down. <laughs> um, and uh, one thing that's that I conveniently leave off my bio, and Mark, you're kind of to share some of the business success that I've had is some real calamities. So uh, as much as I've, I've seen the upside, I've lived the downside to the point where once I decided, now that I know how business works, I'll become an angel investor and I uh, had no clue what I was doing, lost all my wealth, lost my house, lost my possessions. I didn't lose my family. It's the one thing uh, that, that I was able to retain and it was the most important thing to me. And it also set me a trajectory to figure out what makes entrepreneurship successful. In fact, I have a life's mission I have on my wall right here <clears throat> is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. That's my intention today. Entrepreneurial poverty is that gap we experience where we have this intention, that great dream of a business and the reality of struggle. That gap is what I call entrepreneurial poverty. The world thinks you're crushing it from day one. You start your, your architectural firm, you're like, oh my gosh, you're a millionaire now. You, you sit on the beach drinking Mai Tais. And, and the reality is, we're working our asses off. We're not making much money. Uh, we're surviving check by check. We're struggling to land that big client. And uh, that gap is what I want to close. Thank you for being here this morning or afternoon or evening, depending where you are uh, and your attention, because I know you can invest your time in many areas. My goal in our next 30 minutes or so together <clears throat> is to deliver significant actionable value. The first thing I want to start off with is the understanding of the business trend we're going through right now. So Mark, I'm going to hold this up to the screen. This is my slide deck, everyone. I'm sorry. It's not the best. I, oh, I did make a downloadable. There's a website called recessionresponse.com. You don't have to sign up or anything. You'll see just a list of PDFs. So that's available to you uh, if you want to get these slides. This is a, a kind of a core understanding we need to have. And I'm holding it closely to the screen, too. If you prefer to do a screenshot, you can take it that way. <clears throat> but I've been through my own businesses now. This is uh, my third recession as a business owner. Um, but I also have studied every recession 
back to the Great Depression, started in 1929, and there's a common trend, which I drew out here for us, it happened. There is a trigger moment that compromises a destabilized economy. So if you can see on this chart, there's a little dotted line here going into uh, our response, and this is a destabilized economy. The trigger event for the Great Depression was there was a move to the gold standard, Wall Street drops, and then we go into this downward depression for an extended period of time. But we already had a destabilized economy. Well, fast forward to more modern times. If you were around in the 70s, I see some, some Jersey folks here, rock on Jersey. Uh, I was uh, a young child in the 70s. I remember, I don't know, uh, Mark, if you remember this period of time, but the lines to get gas during that recession, uh, the, during the Jimmy Carter days. And that was a destabilized economy triggered by the OPEC oil crisis. So it was a trigger event, economy slips, and then we have this crisis. Well, it happens again and again. You go 2000 with the dot-com bubble and also the terrorist attacks in the U.S. Destabilized economy is now compromised completely. We go into recession. 2008 was the housing collapse for the Great Recession. 2020's course is COVID is the trigger event, but it undermines a really destabilized economy. Things were running too hot and too crazy. And now we're going down. And what happens, <clears throat> what's important is the behavioral response. And there's five distinct stages that small businesses go through. And um, it, it's what's called a mass psychological response, meaning there is a micro psychological response, just you. If you were in a car accident and what you go through psychologically affects you, but a mass psychological event is where there's a community go through it and it often extends the elements. First element is shock, that's stage one. And in the small text here, it says startled or freeze up. Again, you can download it if you prefer. But what happens is the event happens, COVID. Around March, March 15th, we start seeing the shutdown of businesses. What happens in the, in the shock event is there's, there's disbelief. Like this, this can't be real. This was this just for today. And what most of us do is freeze up. If you've ever been in a car accident, and I hope not, but if you've been in a car accident, our mind goes through shock. What happens is there's so much being processed, like what just happened, car wreck, airbag, what's going on, that our brain is trying to over, is overstimulated, trying to process all this stuff, and it starts ignoring certain things. Like you don't feel the broken bone in your arm sometimes for minutes, hours, or even a day because there's too much stimulus. Well, that's what's happening in the shock stage. There's so much input going on about this crisis that we actually don't feel what we need to do for our business, and many of us freeze up. Now, in a mass psychological situation, it's in my estimation, this is not statistically proven, but I find it to be about 90 day cycles. So the shock phase on average lasts 90 days. I suspect, and you can even put in the chat, have you seen from March, April, a little bit of May, have you seen businesses go out of business because they just closed the doors? Restaurants and art, you know, I live in this little town called Booton, New Jersey, it's near Montclair. Uh, we have uh, 20 restaurants, about six or seven of them are permanently closed now. I see Scott, you're with me, you saw that too. Other businesses too, particularly the retail businesses, because they're going through shock. Some business owners respond very quickly. They go through shock for maybe 10 or 15 minutes and say, I gotta move forward. Hopefully you've been one of them. My goal though, regardless of where you are on this chart right now, is to move you to this stage called deliberate action. So shock results in inaction, inaction triggers business collapse. <clears throat> I see Jefferson, you've seen it, restaurants being closed. The next stage, and I would argue we're, we're past the shock stage. Very few businesses are there. Some businesses now are in the desperation stage. Um, and my hope is, again, to move you past that. You're probably past that already, move you to deliberate action. Desperation is where we over-respond. And um, you see this in our personal lives. It happened, happened with the COVID crisis, with the, the toilet paper uh, scare. Did, did, you, did you, just put in the chat, in your area, did you run out of toilet paper? So you can type in no TP, uh, so I know you're, you're, you're connecting with that. Um, so Andrew, no t there's a lot of no TPs. Costco is totally out. Is that true, Cheryl? Unbelievable. Here, <laughs> bought a bidet. Smart, smart response, right? I got a bidet, baby. Here's what happened with the toilet paper situation. There had to be a ground zero. So let's say it was at that Costco, Cheryl. Someone's in Costco and the news is playing over the TV saying, you know, COVID crisis, pandemic, and some guy's buying toilet paper. And he's like, oh, I should get a next, another package. I forgot I didn't have enough. And so he grabs uh, another package. Well, people observing that do this uh, correlation saying, oh my God, there's a COVID crisis. This guy just bought more toilet paper. 
I should have more toilet paper. And that person replicates the behavior. That's when it's all over. Now another person's like, oh my God, people buy more toilet paper. I gotta buy more toilet paper. They call their friends, dude, Costco, running out of toilet paper, get toilet paper. People start going in that town and like buying toilet paper. And that's when the news picks it up and says, town out of toilet paper, uh, toilet paper crisis, and we all start replicating the behavior. That's the desperation stage. There's a hurting mentality where we replicate behavior, even though it makes no sense. Like COVID does not require you, supposedly, to use much more toilet paper. Um, yet we respond that way to an extreme. There's supposedly there's one guy in, in Booton, New Jersey, who has a garage full of toilet paper. His problem is not wiping his ass. He, he's got, his problem now is a 50 year supply of toilet paper. Like, does he have to buy a dehumidification system, security guards for his garage? Like, what's going on? That's the desperation stage. We see it manifesting in business too. And the business manifestation is, well, we saw it once already now with the PPP and the EDIL. I can't remember all the acronyms, but the cash, cash was made available. Businesses say, oh my gosh, uh, it's money. I need money. And we jump on it. And um, companies like the Lakers, which is a company, the basketball team uh, jumps on it and they take their share and Shake Shack uh, took their share. And the government actually said, hey, could you please give us the money back? It was really intended for small, small business, not you, Lakers, most profitable NBA team of all time. Um, <clears throat> and some of these people returned it and some didn't. But it was all triggered by a desperation response. Quick grab for money. And what's interesting is I'm not saying a loan is a good or bad thing, but many businesses were doing without consideration. Why do you need money in the first place? Because if you need to borrow money, even if it's ultimately free money, which is still not known if it's going to be free, but if it's free money... The question is, why do you need that money in the first place? Because there's got to be a root cause behind that that's not, or it's not being addressed. We're band-aiding with cash. So desperation is we, we do something, but we ignore the problem. We run for toilet paper, but we don't necessarily buy masks or something. We, we run to get money, we don't right-size our business, for example. Well, once we get through the desperation stage, uh, and by the way, desperation stage right here says results in big wrong actions that causes business to collapse. Um, I saw one business in our neighborhood slash prices by 50%. They said, we need to keep our sales going. Their margins are 10%. If you cut your prices by 50% and have a 10% margin, you're losing 40% on every transaction. They're out of business. No surprise. Desperate response. What we need to do is get through this trough of evaluation. Evaluation is where you identify what in your business is still working and amplify it was not working. You either jettison, remove it or fix it. And one of the smartest strategies you can use right now in this market is called an upstream look. So write this one down. Many businesses do what's called a downstream look. I believe in a market like this, about 10% of our clients will not do business with us, not because they are being affected by the, the economy, but because they're having a subconscious response, they've always been waffling about their decision. And 10% may not be the exact number, but percentage of my customers came to me, they made a purchasing decision with me, and then they said, I don't know if that was smart. If I'm really getting value, Mike's an okay guy, I don't know. and they're waffling. Now they have an excuse, COVID. And this may be subconscious. They may say, you know what, I, don't, I can't afford to use Mike. And maybe they just don't want to use me. So I have in my one business, 450 active clients, 10% represents 45 clients. A downstream look is I lose those 45 clients. And what do I do? I start to desperately try to pull them back saying, no, 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 don't leave me. I'll, I'll adjust. I'll change. Stay with me. But the realization here and the opportunity is the upstream look. You see your collective competition is losing their 10% too. Well, my collective competition has about 50,000 potential customers of mine that are being maintained by competitors. Well, if they are collectively losing their 10%. That means 5,000 are entering the upstream or 45 are downstream. But if I have my back toward the upstream, it's going to flow right by me. I need to turn and face the opportunity. So in this market, there's about 10% of customers, my estimation, that are entering the market actively looking for a new provider because they waffled about their prior one. And there is this thing called pent up demand and these different things that play in fact, but uh, there's also a thing called the Pareto principle. The estimation is about 20% of those customers that enter the market, again, re-enter the market, are in an active buying state, meaning they're looking to buy now. 
80% are an active no like, and trust. They're just trying to identify the new vendor for the future. And this is true in the architectural industry. It's true in every industry. We've got to look upstream. How do you do it? You start marketing upstream. One of the easiest, most effective ways, there's countless ways to do it, but one effective way is through video marketing. It's a great no like, and trust. As customers go out there and they start investigating who else is out there, they're going to look at videos for information about your offerings, but also simple solutions. I believe YouTube personally is the best platform because it's owned by Google. Google still owns SEO, so go with YouTube. And quick, quippy, succinct videos are effective. If you've ever done a how-to, by the way, and you've been frustrated, like, you're like you know, how to uh, unclog my sink, and some plumber guy comes on, he's like, hi, my name is Joe the Plumber, and let me tell you about myself. I remember plug, clogged, uh, clogged sink and the problems. Oh, my gosh. I had that problem. And he goes on and on and on. And then in the last, you know, after five minutes, he's like, oh, and here's what you do. You just use a plunger and pop it. Start off with use a plunger and pop it. So give the solution right up front. The, the like and the trust happen from the, the, the solution. Because they're like, oh, this person gave me a solution that's effective. That means they, uh, they trust you. They like you because you gave it to them immediately. And then the knowing is the last part. So win the like and trust immediately by providing the solution right up front. Then do the introduction of yourself saying, hey, if that served you, I want to introduce myself. I'm Joe the Plumber. I'm here to help you out. You can call me anytime and check out my other videos. That's how you build no like and trust. Front load those videos. Okay. That's the evaluation phase. Then we want to get to deliver action. I know I'm racing through this. I speak quickly because A, I'm from New Jersey. B, we've got a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, but I hope this is serving you already. Deliberate action is where we take the specific actions that drive our business forward. Not all actions, but only comes out of the evaluation phase. What do we need to do differently now? I got some strategies for you I'm going to share in a second. Once you do that, it puts us in position for what's called the surge. Some people call it the burst. Here's what the surge is. After every single recession, that I've studied, and there's about 17 going back to the Great Depression. Every recession, there's a surge in the economy. But what happens is, it's interesting. Here is the demand for your offering. Here's you and your competition. What happens in a recession is the competition fades away, of course. There's people that were in action. You know, they just kind of froze up. They were in shock. There's businesses that take big wrong actions. They go away. There's people that get stuck in the analysis, paralysis of evaluation, but aren't moving their business forward. So a gap forms. Now the demand remains. It doesn't remain active. It remains in an inactive state, right? So some people are like, I gotta wait on buying. I just gotta play this out. So the demand is there. It's just not activated. So there's decreasing supply. There's pent up demand. Some is still active. Some gets pent up. And then at a certain point, it's the herd mentality. The economy comes confident again, and then buyer demand jumps. When it hits that jump, there is this massive gap in between you need to be in the position to gobble it up. So to prepare for the inevitable, and in my studies, this can be as soon as six months after a trigger event. Um, it can be as long as two or three years. We don't know what we're gonna experience here, but there will be a surge, there always is. The, the way to be prepared for that is take deliberate action right now and, um, and prepare our infrastructure for rapid growth. Starting today, I would argue, you wanna start recruiting uh, employees, investigating technology. Now, let me use the word recruiting. The, I'm not saying hiring people. If you're not in the position to hire, don't hire. Recruiting is building that talent pool, getting ready to bring people on board, reaching out and saying, listen, uh, we expect our architectural firm to really get some legs in the next six months to a year as we're positioning ourselves. We want to have the freedom or the, the privilege to reach out to you at that point to see if you're interested. Would that, would that, is that compelling? And you start building the talent pool so that when the surge hits, you can gobble that up, uh, the talent pool, and get people in place quickly. That's how you prepare. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's go on to the first technique. This is part of the deliberate action phase I want to get you to. This technique is, is a form of reinvention. I call it the one-step back method. Again, you can go to recessionresponse.com, and you can get any of these uh, these things are just quick downloads. Um, what you do is in reinventing your business or reposition yourself to find new things that you can offer is you look at what your historical final offering is and then look at all the steps you take to deliver that offering of yours and see if these little mini steps can become their own offering. In fact, in many cases, 
we are all simply manufacturers. We're assembling different steps together to give a final deliverable. I'll give you an example of the restaurants because that's so active right now. Um, I worked with one restaurant and um, we said, what's your, what's your final offering? And it's putting food on the table. We said, okay, what do you do one step back from that? Well, one step back from putting food on the table, we have a waiter carry the food to the table. Okay, so carrying food to the table is one step back. So carry out or take out is a very obvious solution. Once you find a step back, there's an opportunity for amplification. So, okay, if you carry out food, why not make it one step further and deliver food? Or why not do what one business did in our area here? They teamed up with a food truck. There's a food truck that now has hot meals that are delivering in town you can call in and they'll say, our food truck will be in your area. There's three meal selections in 15 minutes. They're doing the neighborhood delivery. Tell us what you want. Um, they even heard they're starting to ring it like it's a, um, like an ice cream truck in the neighborhood. And some people are coming out and saying, hey, do you have any meals left? I want to pick something up. The, the restaurant is no longer a restaurant. It's a cooking center. They achieve that by thinking one step back. But you see, you can keep on rewinding one step back at a time. So Delivering food to the table is one step back, but what can you do one step prior to that? Well, one step prior to that is uh, when you bring food to the table is preparing food in the kitchen. Okay, preparation of food in the kitchen is another offering. Why not have people prepare food in their own kitchen? You probably have five or 10 menu items that are popular. Why not go to your past patrons? And by the way, in any crisis, the one asset every business always has is past patrons. That's your greatest opportunity for a reinvention of your business. So this restaurant reached out to his past patrons, said, here's our five most popular menu items. We've prepared recipe books so you can prepare them at home. They even took it to an amplification level of doing cooking workshops. So the chef is at their restaurant, COVID appropriate. It's just the, the chef with a, uh, a live feed to the camera. And now people are cooking the meals at home through a live cooking session for an hour or two. They're paying a membership fee for this. They're, they're having fun with their family, doing something at home that's unique and different, and they're reconnecting with neighbors. So, and then you take one step back and you see you can keep on rewinding, step back, step back, and find all these different things you can deliver to your clients. What I wanna invite you to do is look at your historical offering. Simply take the time and say, what do I do one step prior to you know, delivering my final deliverable? Well, what happens one step prior to that? And just write down all the things you historically do. Now you have the list, the, the recipe to build your final offering. Look at each one and say, can I now sell these individual items? The next technique is to reach out to your existing customer base and simply ask them, how can I serve you now? I'll tell you um, who did this well and who didn't. Uh, I'm gonna pick on Chevy, uh, who didn't do it well. I, I own a Chevy car and uh, I got this, this email from Chevy, right? This is back in March. And opened with the worst line you can open with in any email marketing. It said, we're all in this together. It's like, thank you for stating the blatantly obvious Chevy. What are you trying to sell to me, you manipulative bastards? That's what went through my head. And then it went on into this diatribe, like, like 15 paragraphs long, explaining why uh, you know Chevy's prepared for this. If I need an oil change, an, an oil change, I'm not driving my car during a COVID pandemic. Uh, do you want me to try from, from my infected city to move to another Chevy? Thank you, no. You know, in the very end, like, are you ready to buy a new vehicle? We'll drop it off in your neighborhood. No. It was very salesy, very, felt very manipulative. I'll tell you who did an excellent job. I can't believe I'm saying this either because I've never been really a fan, but it's United Airlines. I fly United because they're a hub in New Jersey and they're fine, I think, but they're not exceptional until recently, these emails. United reached out and said, great opening line. It said, uh, we can't even imagine how you're being affected by the COVID crisis. Simply know that our team is wishing you well. Thank you for acknowledging we don't know how people are being affected. That was excellent. Had my attention. It then went on to say, we don't know if you're aware of this, but you've booked a flight. Um, or, or, or I'm sorry. You're not tra it said, you're not traveling as much as, uh, as you have in the past, we suspect, because no one is. We are going to extend your benefits, because I travel in this much, for another year or two. They did something of value to me without me asking. I was like, all right. And then they asked the greatest question. They said, we are still here available to serve you. So if you're ready to fly, we're here to serve you. But realize you may need us in a new way. Please, if you feel compelled or can teach us something new of how we can serve you, please email us back. I was like, oh my gosh. They're inviting my insights after serving me. That's how you sell. 
That's how you communicate. Ask your customers what they need from you now. Tell them you're available in the historical way, but they may, that you can serve them in a new way if they simply tell you. And that's what I did. I gave United some ideas. And uh, they also emailed me again uh, just a few weeks ago. I said, hey, you have an upcoming flight uh, that we're ready to, to, uh, to, to do for you. But in case you want to cancel, because many people are canceling, we want you to know you can cancel and get a full refund. So just making you aware. I'm like, thank you, United, for proactively serving me. And then it said, if there's a new way we can serve you, please tell us. So that's the opportunity for you. Okay, next tip I want to go into. <clears throat> Real simple strategy for navigating crisis. It's called the 10, 10, 10 method. By the way, everything I'm sharing with you is derived, uh, as Mark shared, from, from this book, Fix This Next. Uh, I'll mention something about it in a second. But the 10, 10, 10 method was not developed by me. It's developed by uh, an author named Susie Welsh. Susie Welsh was married to the now sadly deceased Jack Welsh, uh, the CEO, I think it was of uh, GE. And um, what Susie Welsh realized is that it is human nature to put extraordinary significance in what's happening in the moment and not so much or put no significance in the impact of making a decision in the future. So for example, say right now I'm considering laying off, laying off an employee. How will I feel in the moment? Well, horrible. This has been a very loyal employee. They're fantastic. I can't afford them. I can't afford to lay them off though. They've been great. I'll fight through it. Compromising my business, but seeing that relationship. And that's a decision made in the moment. Well, the 10-10-10 method is a way to evaluate a decision over time. Each 10 stands for an increment of time. The first 10 stands for the next 10 minutes. How will you feel about this decision in the next 10 minutes? The next 10 is the next 10 months. The final 10 is the next 10 years. So now when I ask, I'm considering letting go off an employee, how I feel in the next 10 minutes, I'll feel horrible. They've been loyal, they're fantastic. But I ask myself the question, how will I feel in the next 10 months? Well, I'll feel I do the right thing for my business. My business, uh, I won't have the cost of that salary. My business can sustain. In fact, if I can sustain for 10 more months, I might even be able to invite that loyal employee back. If I don't make this decision uh, to let them go in 10 months from now, I may just be totally out of business because I've exhausted my own personal funds. Everything will be gone. How do I feel in the next 10 years? Well, the next 10 years, my business will be around. My dream is to sell my business. I'll have a business that's sellable. So if I make this decision now to let this person go, as painful as it is in the next 10 minutes, the reward's gonna happen in 10 months and surely in 10 years. And by reflecting on this way, we put equal value on inch increment and we can make much better decision making. It's a very powerful decision making tool. All right, I got some more stuff I wanna share with you, uh, but I, I was talking with Mark uh, off air and I did ask him if I could share my book with you and he said, yeah, it was, this group's amazing. They'll love you. <laughs> so thank you. Here's what I want to share. This, everything I'm sharing is from Fix This Next. And I want to do something that I, I will acknowledge is a bold ask. But I want to invite you to get a copy of the book now. In fact, I want to be so bold. If you already have a copy, if you'd be willing to get a second copy of the book right now to give it to a colleague or an acquaintance or friend. And I want to ask you to get it on Amazon now. But let me tell you why. I have, I have two reasons. One is I spent five years working on this book and I wrote it for crisis. I never expected a pandemic, nor did anybody. So this book is, is my life's work. It is the greatest book I've ever written. I've written Profit First, Clockwork. This I truly believe is my best work. It's the most cost-effective way I can serve you. It's less than $25 and it will serve you in growing your business and navigating crisis. There's a second reason and it's a very selfish one. If a group of people buy the book on Amazon, and I'm asking you to get it on Amazon, simultaneously. Amazon's algorithm, how it works is it starts promoting the book. It sees a surge of demand and starts marketing it to other entrepreneurs and business owners. So selfishly, if you get the book now, it will make other entrepreneurs aware of it. And that's why I'm asking. So if you're willing to do that, or if you do it right now, when you get it, please post in the chat. I want to personally thank you. I also, I have a little bonus I, I told Mark about. Uh, email me. So when you get the book, email me, Mike at MikeMichalowitz.com. Actually, I'll open my email now so I can see it. And uh, let's put in the subject line, uh, the, uh, Mark LePage is the rage. Mark, Mark LePage is the rage. And tons of exclamation marks so I can see it. And to say, hey, Mike, I got a copy of the book. I'm going to send you the lost content. There was about 40 sections that didn't make it to the final cut that are super interesting. So put that in the email and I'll, I'll send you the lost content. Carly, thank you for getting the book, by the way. I, I appreciate that. And everyone who's picking up a copy on Amazon, I just want to personally shout you out and thank you. So thank you. Let's go back to more content from the book. 
Um, this is called the double helix trap. It's something I want to prepare you for. And oh, you can get an audible, hardcover, whatever you choose, Fran. Uh, here's, here's how the double helix trap works. Cheryl, thank you, Michelle. Uh, email address is on the book itself. So Mike at MikeMichalowitz.com. When you get it, the name is right there. Mike at MikeMichalowitz.com. The double helix trap is a common trap I'm seeing play out in, in all types of firms. And what this is, is perhaps you can relate to it. The top here says sales and delivery. And you can see how they kind of flip flop back and forth. Tell me if you can relate to this. Your business right now, maybe it's not so active or maybe it's very active. Say it's not so active. That means we need to get out selling. So we ramp our own efforts to sell more and more as much as possible. As we do that, we can't be delivering. So once you get that big engagement, now it's all about delivering. So we start focusing on delivering, but we can't focus on sales. So it, it switches. Now, when we finish delivering, sales are down. I need to focus my time on sales again. And we start this double helix, this trap. It is the... The reason the vast majority of businesses don't successfully navigate uh, the crisis because they are flip-flopping between sales and deliverable. What we need to do is in most businesses, it starts by addressing delivery. So to get out of the double helix trap, if you're experiencing that, is start by amplifying, the uh, by, by bringing on people to do the delivery support. Look at all the work you're doing to complete projects. Ask yourself of this, what is the most re repeating tasks that I just can't stand? Uh, those are the first things you wanna get off your plate. And the key is to use part-time or virtual help. Uh, some, many small businesses try to bring on another like full-time employee. You know, it's a small shop, say it has, say it has one person or a micro sh uh, shop, it's just you. And you bring on one full-time person. You've effectively increased the size of your staff by 100%. That, that's like Google announcing today, Google has 100,000 employees hey, uh, starting tomorrow, we're gonna bring on 100,000 new employees. That would overwhelm Google, but that's 100% growth. So this would be the exact same problem. Don't bring on the next full-time employee because it may be too abrupt of a shift to the demand on your finances. Instead, start bringing on part-time labor and start peeling away the deliverables. As you peel away the deliverables, it starts flattening the delivery curve, allows you to focus more on sales, amplifying sales, and then you can start outsourcing the sales, bringing people on board. Um, Katie, Edwin, Greg, uh, Mick, your name, Ron, thank you. Rich, everyone's getting the book. Thank you. You are serving me. And I promise you, I promise you, it will serve you. It will help you through this crisis. I promise. But thank you for getting it. Okay, let's keep rolling. Um, next thing I want to share, and this is the last uh, big thing, we can do some Q&A, is they're on the website, recessionresponse.com. Again, you can download if you wish. Uh, I talk about the stages of a product path, introducing new products. I am considering 2020 not the Great Recession of 2008, it is the Great Reinvention. We already had the Great Recession, now we're in the Great Reinvention. Business, consumer demand, everything has shifted. And what that means is we may have to offer things in a new way. Well, the one key way to do it that I want to talk about is this box that says betas. Here's how to do a beta. <clears throat> it's a way to generate, Jefferson, thank you for getting a second copy, I appreciate that. Uh, Richard, thank you. Ron, thank you. Here's how you do a beta. The beta is where you go to your client base and you ask them how I can serve you now. Technique I already told you. You then outline your idea and you can do this in less than 24 hours saying, oh, here's what the new offering is going to look like. I, in fact, reach out to my readership saying, what do you need now? Thinking that the feedback would be, you know, a new business book, how to market or something. The number one piece of feedback I got was I've lost my confidence in this market. I need my confidence back. So I immediately said, oh, I should create a confidence course. Now, I've never written self-help stuff before. I've never worked in that space. So I created a beta. I wrote what the confidence course would include, ways to gain confidence, uh, ways to move your business forward, techniques on moving in smite, uh, small blocks of time and so forth. And I said, when I develop this course, I'll sell it for, I'm just gonna pick a magic number, $1,000. I then said, but I'm inviting 10 people on as beta users and the price is only gonna be $500. Um, and what's gonna happen is the, the product is not developed yet. So I'm gonna be developing it. Um, you're gonna get the, the initial release and you're gonna give me feedback what you like and don't like and I'm gonna further enhance it so it's gonna be customized to your need. It's gonna be a little bumpy, it's not gonna be perfect, but do you, are you interested? Here's the power of that ask. If no one's willing to buy, 
that means uh, no one's no one's interested and in that you shouldn't develop that product. If people are willing to buy, you should develop it. And if no one's willing to buy, maybe you have to modify your offering. Well, once I got that beta group in, I said, okay, this is an offering people are willing to put money down. This is something I should develop. I develop it for them. I get their feedback. They're very engaged because I'm customizing it toward them. Then I rolled it out to my main list of prospects and said, here's my new conference course for $1,000. I also said, hey, I have 10 testimonials you got to check out. The beta users. I want to invite you to do some version of this. Can you, if you want to invent a new offering within your architectural offering, can you create a beta and get some initial customers on there testing it out? But always, always have them make an investment. If they're not willing to put down money, they're not willing to buy. Don't trust people's words. Trust their wallets. Often people say, that's a great idea. I would buy it all day long. And then you ask for the money and they don't do it. So ask for the money right up front. Trust wallets, not words. Okay. That was some basic parameters, Mark, I wanted to give you to navigate the recession. Um, if there's some q and A, I I'd gladly do it. A couple more things. I do want to just thank Melissa, Kurt, Bloom. I think I said, I hope I said your name correctly. Uh, Katilia, thank you for everyone that's getting a book. Really, that means a lot to me and I promise it'll serve you. So thank you. And do email me so I get you the lost content. I want to thank everybody who's buying the book as well. I just want everybody to know it, I'm, I'm buying five copies. Oh, that's huge. I'm, I'm going to give away four to members of Entree Architect. So if you are a member, then you have access to the Slack group. Direct message me the first four people who need it. This is not, this is not just a giveaway. This is for the people who really want this book but can't really extend the 20 bucks or whatever it is. It's a little, I think it's less than 20 bucks. Yeah, um, now. yeah it's, it's less than 19. And so if, it, if you want the book and you can't buy the book right now, direct message me. I have four of them. I'm going to give them to the first four people who really need them. You have to Slack, uh, Slack message me in the, uh, in the Entree Architect membership Slack. Thank you, Mark. Mark, and, funny. So Brian says Mark LePage is the rage. Edwin Smart, Steve Waldron. I'm going to get everyone the free content. So definitely email me. Definitely. Scott my, uh, Mazzi, I hope I said your name correctly. I just saw your note. It's Mazze. And, it, and uh, it's Mike at Mike McCallowitz. I'll have the link. Uh, actually, let me post the link right here. Mike, Mike, yeah. And you don't have to send the receipts. I see some people were saying receipts. You know, I, I trust you. Just uh, to say I got the book. I've, uh, I've memorized the spelling of your name. I was going to put it in. <laughs> I got it. There you go. That's oh, it. No, I did it. It's wrong. It's wrong. You did it wrong. It's I'll do it. Go ahead. There it's it is. Mike at MikeMichalowitz.com. All right, Mike. I did Mike M. Gosh, we're struggling here. <laughs> don't click mine and don't click Mike's. It's Mike There's at the one Mike to click on. there, right, there we go. All right. If anybody has any questions, post them in the Q&A. Uh, Taylor said that uh, I've had the book for a couple of months. It's great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Aaron says it can be tough potentially to wind back the architectural process. Yes. Quote unquote, to offer new marketables. Um, it seems like offering a uh, half made sausage. Thoughts on how you might do that? That's a great observation and it is tough. And that's why the vast majority won't do it. Um, and therefore, that's why we have to do it. It is a half baked sausage until you make it into a new product and you grind it up and it becomes a taco or something like that. So go through the process and look for it. Let me give you an example. I haven't done it with an architect yet. I just did it with wedding planners. You know, wedding planners really got hammered in this uh, because no one's having weddings. So we said, well, what happens, you know, once the final product is an amazing wedding, what happens before it? Coordination of guests and the, the uh, collection of the different accoutrements and so forth. And we realized, oh my gosh, the guests receiving gifts is part of the wedding process. They get the welcome little gift and there's a toasting of champagne. This wedding planner, what we did is we, did, we made this box. So this wedding became a virtual wedding. We sent out a box. In the box was about 10 more boxes, each with a number on it. And during the ceremony, I said, okay, everyone open box one. You open it. It was like a champagne, a small champagne bottle with two flutes. There was, uh, you know, uh, confetti to throw up in your house. They had everyone throw it up in the virtual environment, which was incredible. They reinvented it. And this wedding planner now got a, a reputation for this. Uh, a DJ, this one DJ said, you know, I deliver these, uh, um, these, these parties for big events. Um, the thing is you can't go to facilities anymore, but it's the selection of music and get people out dancing on the floor. How do I get people to dance on the floor? Oh, you have to get people dancing on the floor. They started going into neighborhoods and they go to a cul-de-sac in a neighborhood and, and start just 
blare music and say, we have a 15 minute dance party going on here. And people start coming out of their houses and are dancing in the, their driveways. And then the DJ says, thanks for dancing with me. This was sponsored by Joe's Takeout Pizza. They're ready to take your orders. So he was getting paid by a sponsor who was a restaurant who was attracting more business this way. Really thoughtful approach. I don't know what your solutions are, but you have to peel back the onion to all your steps and you'll find things in there, I assure you. Jennifer says, uh, I sell some pre-designed services as an initial package. I've created a template so that I can provide a deliverable that's consistent. So she's giving you some, some ideas there, pre-designed package. Put together some of the things we do early on, sell it and, and get it out there. Because I think a lot of people are doing, you know, a lot of people who are our clients are considering, oh, I want, might want to do a project, right? And they're, they're calling some, some architects, if you're out there. I'll, I'll give you another example. One architect I did, actually do know uh, did vision boarding. So, you know, they, they rewound their process and they said, uh, you know, one of the main steps of architectural design is talking to the customer and getting their vision documented. They said, we did a virtual activity uh, where we just do vision boarding. And we said, listen, you're not ready to build or, or do this uh, perhaps for another four, four or five years. But now you know what your dream is and we're going to do this beautiful uh, printout and you're going to post it on your wall. So every single day you see your dream. And I don't know what they charge. It was maybe four or $500 for a couple sessions, but it was really a unique way. And they anchored themselves in because their logo's at the bottom. So there's, there's definitely ideas out there. Uh, Carly says, love the ideas um, of offering something different. I've been, whoop, just moved. I've been developing an idea for a quote, move or improve consultation. I love that. Uh, which I'm doing as a trial Love that. People to help them decide if a project is right for them. Great, Carl. That's a great idea. Yeah, and, and you can see ideas. You know, watch these television shows. It's like, you know, flip or flop or something like that. Like, watch these shows that are out there and see the decisions that customers are making. And that's why I hear Carly doing saying, and I love move or improve. I love the rhyme. That's powerful. Yeah, But you can, you can start delivering this as a service. Um, and, and, and people are sensitive that the marketing is being done for you, right? These TV shows are popping out these ideas. You can now leverage that. Those are commercials for you. If you can say, oh, we do exactly what you saw on TV. Heidi says, uh, I do a condition assessments of existing buildings as a first step. Uh, also, Frank is pitching your book here. He says, uh, fix, this ne fix This Next is by far the best book I've read on business. I completed the FTN analysis every month. And it's made a huge difference in each of my businesses. After Profit First, this is the next one you should read. Thank you. And uh, Mark, the emails are pouring in. So Katie Kangas, uh, Michael Maturo, Jefferson Shearbeek, Stephanie. Skierbeek. Skierbeek, I'm sorry. Stephanie Kirshner, Nancy Lands, Michael Crabtree, uh, Angela, it's Sam, Sarah. It says, <laughs> Mark LePage is the rage. And there, there are some people hammering out the exclamation marks. Nancy Lands gave you a six exclamation marker. Hmm. There we ah. go. There we go. That's my, those are my people, Mike. Those are my people. <laughs> Michael Crabtree says, I offer consulting to architects, builders, and pool designers who are struggling with their workload due to possible layoffs due to a pandemic. I started doing this in 2009 uh, during a recession. I could say Michael does a great job. He's worked for me as well. Um, uh, Michelle uh, Hoddle says, uh, but better than what you see on TV. <laughs> Yes. Like, old, right? like TV, but better. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, the TV, see those things as your commercial and know that customers will resonate with that and then point out, say, listen, we, we amplify that. We do it right. No. All right, uh, I'm going to get your name here. Let's see if I can get it. Ada, Ada, Ada Lowo. Ada Lowo says, um, I was contacted by a client for architectural services, but the guy just switched off all attempts to follow up was just useless emails, SMS calls. Oh, that was a client they were trying to reach out to? Yep, yep, I guess. The, so, yeah, so how do you handle that, right? So a customer's blowing you off? Yep. Um, typically, you, uh, you do the, I call it the ultimatum. Uh, I send out one final communication saying, haven't heard back from you, uh, should we end this right now? And I simply say, listen, I haven't heard back from you, I understand that you may be overwhelmed. Just say, respond, uh, yes, uh, I still wanna have communication or no, uh, and I won't bother you again, and please know I'm wishing you well. And people respond to that. I have another email that's very successful. Uh, I simply say, are you okay? But it has to be authentic. So if I don't hear from a client, I'll simply put a subject line saying, are you okay? Question mark. I'll put in there saying, I haven't heard from you, which isn't what I expected. I don't care about our business. And I don't even want to talk about business. I just want to make sure that you are okay. 
Now that has to be authentic. I wouldn't do it for everybody, but when it's a strategic relationship, I do that. That has a hundred percent success rate. And, and most of the time people say, I'm totally fine. Um, I just, I'm overwhelmed. And sometimes people say, yeah, there's been a scare or, or something going on and I, you know, I can empathize with it, but it re uh, instigates that, that dialogue. Yeah, that last chance email uh, as well is one that usually gets yeah. a response because very often it's people that just, you know, they're, they're doing other things. They have other priorities. Oh, sure. They're frozen in their decision making and so they just haven't responded. So if you sort yeah. of kick them into gear and ask them for a response, they will. Yeah. It may not be the one you want, but it, it'll, be, uh, it'll be a response. Yeah, but, but you know, even if it's not the one you want, at least you have something and you can get rid of the, the time, the thought right. time. Because you're trying to go to bed uh, thinking, is this client going to call me or not? is wasted thought time. I'd rather you're working on gaining new clients. So if they right. say no, it's a little bit of pain for a lot of relief. Yeah, we have a few more minutes here for a few more questions. If anybody wants to post them here. Uh, any and suggestions for up, upstream too. marketing, where and how to grab these upstreams? Yeah, so the upstream is, again, they're looking for the no like, and trust. So downstream is trying to recapture lost clients and prospects. Realize that you know, if you're losing tons or something going on, if you're losing that 10%, there's about 10% in my estimation that are making a subconscious decision to go elsewhere. So we do a turn, we look upstream. There's 10% that are entering the market. Educational marketing is the essence. Now I shared YouTube as an example, but uh, a webinar like this, inviting in customers, running an ad to prospects on Facebook or something, ask yourself, where's the congregation points? Do People uh, subscribe to architectural magazines or home and design stuff, or do they listen to certain podcasts, or do they talk to real estate agents? Like, where do they go when they have these questions? Build relationships with them. Maybe they talk to their real estate agent saying, listen, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about moving, but I'm thinking about improving. Um, what should I do? Why not start a, do a podcast with that real estate agent and say, hey, bro, invite in all your historical customers. I'll invite in mine. We'll have a dialogue around this stuff. That's a great way to start attracting in new customers that are looking for a new architect. All right. We're going to start wrapping things up. Uh, Jun Tao just said, is the audio uh, audible version just as good? And her question is, you know, because she bought some other books that have a lot of graphics in them and she regretted the audio books. First of all, I just want to pitch the audio book for profit first. Actually, he read, Mike reads all his own audio books. Yeah. They are awesome. I would buy them in addition to the print version. Do both. But Mike, Thank what you. do you say? So uh, I'm really proud of the Fix This Next Audible. I think it's my best one. Uh, uh, there's probably about two hours of additional content and I riff in it and we, we break from the book, but you get the entire book. All the graphics are also downloadable, so you don't miss a single graphic. They do work in synchronicity because what I'll do is I'll start talking about stuff I wrote in the book. So you'll be looking at it in the book and you'll be hearing why stuff is in a certain way and it gives you a different perspective. But I think you'll love the Audible. It was so much fun to do too. Yeah, Mike does a great job with his Audible. Probably, probably the best Audible books that I've ever bought because he, oh, thanks, he, he goes off script and goes does his thing. And you know, I'm a Jersey boy too. It makes me feel at home. So. Yeah, you might hear the Jersey references. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Like yeah. So we have, we have time for one more question if anybody has any questions. Mike, you want to you want to wrap things up? Yeah, I want to share one final thought, and, and um, it's kind of bold. It's a responsibility we have. We have a responsibility to sell in this market. You know how I visualize this market is. You know, we small businesses. We're walking down the road. Things are okay, fine. Back on March 14th, and then March 15th, whatever COVID hits, it was like it was like walking down Main Street America, and out of a dark alley comes this monster, and it just cold cocked us in the face. And we got, you know, a black eye, bloody nose, a knocked out tooth. And it was the world. And the world said, hey, uh, now that I have your attention, save me. Please save me. I used to say that small business is the backbone of the economy. And I regret saying that now because it's not. Small business is the economy. For us to survive as a global economy, it is fully contingent upon your success, small business success. As I shared, I studied every recession back to the Great Depression. Every single time, what pulled us out of recession? Small business, reinventing the way things were done, uh, creating new offerings, being agile. The, the, the big companies, they're, they're in tanker ships and we're on jet skis. We can turn, spin, and change rapidly. They can't. So we have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to sell into this market. I understand that this is an unknown time and it's scary and challenging. 
I want to empower you. I want you to be emboldened to stand up, step forward, and start selling. Sell in a new way, sell in a better way. Because if you're successful, the economy is successful. And the beautiful thing is this, I know we'll get through this. Every economy we've navigated, it's always been small business. My only question is, why not this time it be you? You be the one. So I'm wishing you great luck and I'm wishing you to be the one who finds the fix to this economy. Yeah, amen. You can learn more about Mike and his book at fixthisnext.com. The handouts that he was showing, uh, recessionresponse.com, recessionresponse.com. And there's a lot of other stuff there as well. So go there and it's all free. You don't even have to give an email. Uh, this session has been recorded. It's going to be available to members for download. It's also live on uh, Facebook in the Facebook group right now, entrearchitect.com slash group. If you're not a member of the Facebook group, it's over there. It'll be there. The recording will be there. But the download will be for members. And don't forget, I bought four books. I bought five. I bought four to give away. So if you can't buy one, uh, DM me in Slack as a member and I will send you one. First four. Um, tomorrow, just just a little bit of homework. I know, Mike, you need to go tomorrow. Yeah, gonna, if it's okay, I'm going to drop because I got to run. Yes, on. go ahead. But thank, thank you, you everyone. Mike. I appreciate you. All right, see you, Mark. Appreciate Have a good you, one. Buddy. Yep. Every, everybody else here tomorrow, don't miss the Ask Me Anything event over at the Architects and Allies Facebook group featuring Nikita Morel. Uh, the Architects and Allies group is a new Facebook group that, that was spurred off, that was inspired by the Entree Architects Facebook group. Um, and so, which is where some of you are listening right now. The, the Architects and Allies Facebook group includes architects and all our allies, all the AEC allies. So contractors, engineers, interior designers, uh, consultants, uh, media, all of them, they're over there. Nikita Morell is, is a copywriter who specializes in working with architects and she's going to be there tomorrow uh, with our moderators uh, answering your questions. So tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern time, uh, July 22nd, Wednesday, starting at 4 p.m. Eastern time, Nikita Morell, Ask Me Anything at the Architects and Allies Facebook group. Um, let's see here. The uh, It's facebook.com slash groups slash architects and allies spelled out. If you want to get a link to join that. It's a private group too, so you have to be an AEC member. Only AEC members are in that group. Thank you all for attending today and making this so uh, special for Mike. I really appreciate everybody buying the book. That helps Mike a lot. Mike has been a great supporter of us here at Entree Architect over the years. He's done the podcast three times, and there's a fourth one coming soon. I, I interviewed him about to fix this next, so watch out for that. Um, thank you. Thank you all for coming today, and have a great day. Hope you found some value in this. I appreciate you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye.